We're at Geneva Airport in Switzerland, uh, well, a car park right next to the airport, where the Jaguar I-Pace is being put through its paces. Sorry about the pun. And you can hear someone giving it beans behind me, but this is the first time the world's media has actually got to drive this car. Jag have put an awful lot of effort into this. They've done over 1.5 million real world miles. There's over 200 prototypes flying around. They've tested it in plus 40 Celsius, minus 40 Celsius. They're taking this car very seriously. And bear in mind, they've beaten the likes of Audi, BMW and Mercedes to the production pure SUV market. Tesla's already out there with a the Model X, which is a vastly more expensive car. That starts from 59,000 pounds, goes up to about 75,000 pounds. There's another one. And this is an exciting time because Tesla have obviously stolen the limelight for a kind of fast, luxurious, unbeatable electric cars. But Tesla are a tech company first, a sort of car company second, really. The likes of Jaguar and Mercedes and all the others have been making cars for like eight, nine, ten decades. And that's the thing, they know how to build a car really well. Tesla has almost become a victim of its own success lately, where it's got a good product, but it can't make it quick enough, and it's suffering from quality control. Jag and Mercedes and Audi and BMW and all the others that are coming in now, these guys know how to build a car. They know how to put together a beautiful interior. So we're actually going to see this interesting point of convergence, I think. Tesla are going to learn very quickly how to mass produce a car with decent quality control. And these guys know how to do good battery tech, good real world range, and good EV good EV performance. What I'm interested in with the Jag I-Pace today is although I'm going to get a little tiny drive, I want to know if this car has true Jaguar DNA. And by that, what I mean is Jaguar is known for its sports cars and its sports saloons. So cars that can go fast in a straight line, but they're also very, very agile. And agility is something that a lot of EVs on, on sale now don't actually have. And the other thing about Jags is they're refined. They can be smooth. They can be really serene. You've got that waftability with a huge amount of clout. And that's what I hope the I-Pace will deliver. I feel like we're at a really interesting point in the world of EV, where mainstream manufacturers are about to press the button on some really big projects, some really credible cars, you know, Porsche with its Mission E, Audi with its e-tron range, Mercedes with its EQ, Jag with the I-Pace, and this platform will no doubt be used on another car in the next 12 to 18 months. So these are really exciting times, and this is friendly competition, really. It means Tesla will step up even more. It means these guys will work even harder. So for EV people like you and I, this is only, it's only going to be good news. And it will also mean that more people will buy it, which means the infrastructure will get better, which is like a win-win, right? Oh, it's hustling along nicely, isn't it? Alright, we're in the I-Pace. This is a very brief first drive of a production-ready car. We're doing something called a smart cone test, which is essentially a very short, sharp um, agility test. Um, it's not a proper road test, it's not on the road. Um, I'll explain more in a minute. So, we just go, do we? We can go. The green uh, cones are flashing. I don't really know how to do this. I normally just drive fast around a car park in random Well, in, this is driving fast order. around a car park in a structured way. So, I've so got... we're going to go through those green flashing cones there. And then yep. you want to look for the next set of cones, which is that one there. And you're going to go through those. Where are the next set? Okay. Uh, up to the far end where the pit lane is. You can see the blue ones there to your left. And they're going to be your next set of cones. Yeah, and then you want to go over to the right, you can see another set over there. Oh, hang on. Uh, oh, there straight ahead, there's green. Okay, yeah, yeah. Hard left, because those ones that were blue are now green. This is like a game. That's it, it's like a game. And we've all played those games where you're hitting the wall, aren't you? <laughs> I've never played lights. a game where I'm hitting a yeah, wall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, the fitness the, game, not with a car. The fitness game, that's it, yeah, yeah. So it's okay. a fitness game transported into the car environment. No, this is cunning, there. because I'm... I'm concentrating more on cones than I am on the chassis of the eye pace. But uh, it, I love the response. Obviously, four and a half seconds to 60. Have I just missed that completely? I haven't. Yeah. I thought I went through a pair of cones that wasn't actually a pair of cones. A little bit of a whine off the motors. That's good. Um, obviously, the thing about electric cars is they carry a bit of bolt. This is over 2.1 tonnes. 
with the high powered region you can feel it's hustling quite well really well actually and that's red does that mean definitely uh, don't red. go through red means game is over oh what you're gonna go up to the far end i'm here with ian hoban ian Johnny. you you are re remind me of your title you're basically the man that didn't shape the car I didn't shape the car, no, that was Mr. Callum. That's, yeah. that's the, the other Ian, that's yeah. right. Um, so uh, I'm the vehicle line director, so really lucky to lead the team of engineers who put their heart and soul into delivering this car. We've got this awesome cutaway. I'm a big fan of cutaways because it explains so much really quickly. But um, let's talk about first its construction, the body shell and the chassis. Okay, so um, predominantly aluminium, 94% aluminium is the body structure which is actually the most aluminium content in a, in a production Jaguar. 94%? 94%. That's yeah, pretty good. Um, so, uh, and aluminium's great, you know, it's, it's light, it's very stiff as well, but it's important to use the right type of aluminium in the right place. Yep. So you, these are structural castings, uh, yep. the turrets here, the suspension here. Yep. So these are the, the nodes, the structural nodes of the car. Uh, and it's really important to have a great level of, um, of stiffness here. Yep. That helps us give the car its dynamic capability. So a lot of stiffness here means when you put a steering input into the car, the car changes direction really quickly. This is not a welded car, am it's, I right? It's uh, riveted, it's yep. riveted and bonded. Aerospace, uh, aerospace bonding and riveting are the two construction techniques we use. Right. and then. Right at the front here is uh, one of two hearts. It's a two motor car. That's right, an electric motor on the front axle and, and one on the rear. Yep. And we're quite proud of the motor. Um, it's got a uh, concentric motor uh, and the reason that's important, what that means is the drive shaft actually goes straight through the motor. I remember so it's the hollow motor. motor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, the, and what's the reason for that? So uh, it helps the motor be very lightweight. So it's about 78 kilograms with the motor and the, the, the transmission. Okay. But probably right. even more importantly, it helps it be really compact. So it's about 500 millimeters um, actually, but about 250 millimeters uh, in diameter. So a motor like this uh, will, will deliver about a 95%, in fact, greater than 95% efficiency. Yeah not just high levels of efficiency, but over a wide drive cycle or, or high levels of a high range of speed. So between about 30 kilometers an hour and 150 kilometers an hour, this motor will deliver more than 95% efficiency. And motors are obviously very efficient, yeah. but some of the ones that our competition use are perhaps in the 92 to 93% efficiency range. Right, okay. Um, so so it's it's the, 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 uh, the rare earth magnet part is a particularly important part in terms of how we deliver that efficiency. So on top of that motor, we have yeah, so on top of the motor, we have the inverter. Yeah. So uh, that's the inverter which basically nice. controls, uh, or in between the battery and, and controls the load into the motor and, and, and regulates the torque demand uh, from the driver yep. into the motor. So that's the inverter. And then on top of the inverter, we have the onboard charger. So yep. This is the uh, seven kilo onboard charger, which you can see obviously is connected to the, uh, to the charge port. Yeah, now there's a good space here, which presumably is for crash protection. That's right, that's right, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about thermal scavenging, because it, it's a you term that to I don't use. That. You enjoy, you, it's you because to work it into the conversation. I had to work it into the conversation, because I heard it, it, I saw it in a press release, and I thought, right, thermal scavenging, it's a great term to Discuss. use. And also, obviously, we're in winter right now, yeah. when EVs have a bit of a tough time. That's right. Um, talk me through it. Okay, so batteries are like us. They don't, they don't like to be too hot, they don't like to be too cold. So 20, 25 degrees C is fine. It's the ideal operating range for a battery. And you've got to, what we'd like to do, obviously, keep the battery at that temperature range. Yeah. So that's the first important part. Um, the other important part is, you, it, I guess in a constructive way, it makes you as an engineer be paranoid about the energy that's around you, how you use that energy and how you use it most efficiently. So the thermal scavenging actually is, um, even on a freezing morning, the car can, using a series of heat exchangers and pumps can basically scavenge uh, energy, temperature and energy from the front of the car. People often think that because it's freezing, you can't get any, any, any more energy, but of course we're on a Kelvin scale here. Yeah. So even on the freezing morning, you can still get energy out of the air, actually use it to, um, to uh, provide energy to the battery. So this is like a heat pump from a house? Similar principle, yeah. basically, scavenging it through a heat exchanger, compressing it, and then providing that energy to the battery. And we estimate there's about a two and a half um, uh, times upgrade. So a, a kilowatt of, of energy that's scavenged from the front of the car yep. can benefit the battery by two and a half kilowatts. So it's a real important aspect of, um, of how we um, maintain the range in all driving and conditions. maximize it, I suppose. Uh, that's right. I mean, if we didn't do that, we estimate that perhaps you, the customer might lose anything up to 50 kilometers of range, which is a big deal. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so it's important to, to use the most energy or to maximize the usage of the energy that's around you at all okay. times. It, incidentally, you can also um, uh, scavenge or, or benefit from some of the, the thermal um, thermal properties or the, the, the thermal energy of the, the motors as well in the EDU. So you can take some temperature from, from there and again, use that to heat the cabin. And is that through, um, that's through heat exchanging? Ba that, basically, right, similar okay. principle. Here. This whole floor pan is your battery pack that gets bolted up under, from underneath, forms part of the structure, forms the yeah, entire right. floor of the car. Mm. And 36 modules? 36 modules. So each one of these is the module. Yep. And each module contains 12 pouch cells. Yep. So that's 432 pouch cells in total. Yep, okay. Uh, in the 36 modules that are within the frame. Yep. And these are um, how many volts each? So these are nickel manganese cobalt um, pouch cells. Okay, so the, o the overall voltage of the battery pack is 450 volts. When it's fully charged, around 450 volts. Yeah, but devising a system like this, a floor pan which bolts in and out of a vehicle, and the uh, opportunity to go four-wheel drive or two-wheel drive, this could be put into a lot of other cars. It's, um, I guess it's very flexible, yeah. is what you'd say. So the basic principles, the modularity principles are, are there for us to to yeah. use in the future, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was a bit of a Radio 4 answer, wasn't it? But, that was uh, quite Radio 4. Yeah, sorry about but that. But I'll take it. <clears throat> okay, okay. So we're now at the point where the, the driver and passenger are going to sit about there, the back seat's kind of over the... So that's the back, the, what we call the Becker, but the battery, the battery control module. Yeah. So that sits on, on top of the battery. Controller, yeah. Uh, you can access it through, through the, underneath the rear seat, but probably more importantly, that's one of the first modules to be uh, what we call SOTA, so software over the air. Okay. So using our telematics module, we can basically provide software updates to that module and the customer doesn't have to go to, uh, to a dealer to get it. Brilliant. Regen's really important and I know Regen's come on a long way in EV productions. You've got several stages of Regen. Yeah, there's two. Two stages of Regen, high Regen and low Regen. Okay. So um, we actually call it um, single pedal driving and, it, yeah. and it, it sounds a little odd but it is really, really intuitive and when you've tried it, Honestly, it's, you really wouldn't want to go back. Basically, when you with high high levels of regen, you come off the uh, off the accelerator pedal, and the yeah. car will obviously start to slow down very quickly. Immediately, Immediately. so it's kind of it dragging its brakes. It feels like it's well, it's recuperating the energy through the brakes. Yes, or yeah. into the, into the, yeah. into the car. So what's actually um, we can deliver a, a point up to 0.2 g um, of braking force through that level of regen. Right. There's a further 0.2 g to make 0.4 g in total when the customer actually applies the brake as well. But what's really important is that actually we've done some work and we reckon around 98% of all customer braking situations you can actually do by letting the car do regenerative braking. Without touching the brake. So that's why we call it single pedal. And, yeah. it, and it is, yeah. it's, um, it's so, so intuitive. In fact, incidentally, we can get through a whole test cycle, an emissions test, test cycle again, without pressing the brake pedal. Really? So there's benefits in terms of brake pad wear, of yeah. brake dust. I've not seen this against any other cars, but to me, this looks like a smaller car than an F-Pace. It is smaller than F-Pace, yeah, it's, it's, it's shorter than F-Pace, but I yeah. think the real added benefit of, of a ground up blank sheet of paper um, architecture is in the length. Right. So in the length terms, this car is 50 millimetres shorter than, yeah, okay. than, than F-Pace, yeah. but in wheelbase terms, 115 millimetres longer. The real benefit is, of course, the, the occupant space, the interior space we're liberating. The cab forward design really enables us to to, to position the occupants further apart and you know the knee room again is far more beneficial for for a car like this so the perception of space yeah. on a, on a bev on an electric vehicle is, yeah. is really well really that's great. what i'm looking forward to as the driver you'll see there's much more of an airy cabin i know that there was there was talk about comparing it to a porsche kn um, ah yes, that's internal right. space that's right yeah. porsche mccann external dimensions that's, that's right with it's within a millimeter of a mccann is it but really? actually the interior uh, space is, uh, is, is bigger than a cane. Yeah, that's that's right. impressive though. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, a one segment bigger Sig car. Significant segment above. Yes, yeah. right. I guess that's where EVs win. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Ian, thank, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, thank I you. Lo I love looking at a cutaway. Thank you. This is the Jaguar I-Pace. This is the man that led the team that made it look the way it does. This is Ian Callum, Director of Design for Jaguar, a friend of mine. Hi, Ian. Hi, Johnny. You all right? How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. likewise. 
what interests me about this car, firstly, is it's classed as an SUV, but I kind of don't see it as an SUV. I guess in my head you think of SUVs as being quite bricky. Yeah, square. And it's not like that. No, I it mean, doesn't have to be. No, we stood next to it. It's, it's yeah. higher. You can obviously see yeah. it's, yeah. there's a bit of, uh, you know, ground clearance going on here, but it's not your sort of archetypal. No, and you know what I love about it is you can't really define the car. You can't just slot it in a box and say that's what it is. Yeah. And I love the notion. It upsets some people, but I do love the notion that you can't categorise it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a bit like music in America. It has to be categorised, isn't it? And then yeah. suddenly, somebody comes up with something different, and you can't categorise it, and get some people get upset. So I like that being disruptive, and it is technically an SUV. It's yep. got SUV dimensions. It can only do what it can do. What SUV cars or trucks can do, but yep. it's shaped more like a motor car for good reason. Yeah. And that's aerodynamics. I've just dropped a chapstick, Ian. I'm ever so sorry. It's never happened in an interview before. <laughs> um, uh, actually, while we're at the front, this is probably the most familiar part of the yeah. car. Yeah. Yeah, it was important. The car is so different in so many ways. Yes, it's got the, the voluptuous shapes of a Jaguar, almost yep. like a cab forward shape. Yeah. But it was important that we created something that people recognise as today's Jaguar. We couldn't deviate too much away from it because people just wonder what it was. Yeah. So it looks like a Jag. So you've got the, um, these sort of familiar frowning headlights. Yep. The J, what do you call double them? Double J blades. The double J blades, which is the sort of daytime running yeah. kind of LEDs. Yeah. This shape grille, which we saw first of all in the XF. XF and yeah. Uh, yeah which was your sort of first new generation? It was, and it's inspired by the original XJ6, that lovely square grille that inset into the sheet metal, yeah. subtly, but it did do that. So yeah, that's and there is, there is depth here. You can probably see there is, a, there is definitely a depth into the grille. It sort of stands, sits in. But then, of course, fun. the bonnet, you've got this sort of quite defined haunch here and quite a short bonnet compared to what we used to. So the bonnet's short because there's only a small electric motor down there, an inverter. Yeah. and a charger so it doesn't have to be long there's no straight six engine in there any longer yeah so it can be shorter and there'd be no reason to make it any other way you know to be absolutely honest about the car it's got to be about what the car stands for yeah but to get the drama out of the car if you look at the side view we put these haunches on it they're going to throw the visual weight forward yeah so it looks like it's got this attitude a bit like a mid-engine sports car has you know okay. it, it kind of throws it it's forward doing that, it's doing that, that rather than that exactly okay okay yeah See, I like the back of this because it's, it's very unconventional for a Jag mm -hmm. and it's very abrupt. Air, air flows, physics. Right. So as the air comes off the roof, we've designed this at an angle. It doesn't need a wiper, by the way, because it, the, whole, the air holds on to the profile all the way to the back. Right. And then you get the breakaway uh, in terms of aerodynamics on the square back end. Yeah. As you probably know, the square of the back end on a car, the better the aero. Yeah which is something that, that um, Malcolm Sear didn't fully realise till he got to the XGS. Right, Inter okay. Interestingly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is a floating spoiler. Floating spoiler, which just helps to guide the air through the surface. That's actually what it does. Right. And in terms of downforce, to get equal downforce between the front and the rear, we put this little lip spoiler in, which just adds a bit of perfect balance to the car. When you knew that you were going to design an EV, mm. were you a bit nervous were you thinking it might not be exciting enough for me I no I, I i didn't i felt very excited because i'd already had the kind of idea in my own mind what we could do with it yeah. this idea of a cab forward car yeah was what i think very exciting i've always loved cab forward mid mid-engine sports cars i grew up with them when they were new to the world and this just so, i just saw this as a natural development of that yeah that train of thought and i didn't struggle with it at all i knew other people might and some of them did but well, I, I, if something's, I, I, it is radical. You know, you would, you could, you would consider. I consider this car to be radical. It's radical for the company. Yeah. Um, and it's radical in terms of its shape because yeah. it's not following any existing EV in shape. I don't think. But it's, it, but it has full integrity. Yeah. You know, it is very logical. What yeah. we've done is entirely logical. There's nothing mysterious or, or there's nothing contrived about it at all. Yeah. It is the way it is for very good reason. Yeah. We're allowed now we've been permitted to get in another eye pace and do a little bit of a sort of straighter, less frantic, less cone orientated drive. So I'm just gonna put it in D and uh, release the handbrake and we're gonna go for a little spin. Now I've already put my heated seat on with this, um, this nice tactile rotary control because that's the thing to remember. This is called the flight deck. Uh, 
Jag called this the flight deck, and what this is, is you've got two touch screens here, and then you've got a, a, a nice full instrument graphic screen here. But they've decided to divide it between um, your more uh, obvious day-to-day -day stuff, like your seat controls, with this push-pull, really lovely little wheel, thumb wheel here. So while I'm driving and I don't want to take my eyes off the wheel, I can do the climate control and stuff with relative ease. But then you've got all the infotainment here, which at the moment is showing graphics of like um, regen braking, that kind of thing. Or your infotainment and its swipe, all the stuff you'd expect from a lot of car companies. I've got my heads up display here. I've got my sort of deep dish sporty three spoke steering wheel, which you've seen on other Jag models. But what I'm really thinking about is the way it rides. I've seen the way it goes around tight corners with the, the, the cones and the body control is very flat. The test cars I'm driving have got the optional air suspension, which you can adjust 90 millimeters in height. So it sets, it either goes uh, 40 down or 50 up um, to do off-roading, or it drops down at high speeds on the motorway for efficiency, or when you get out the car, so you don't have to climb up so high. The other thing to bear in mind is you've got your, down here on the right, you've got actual buttons for your off-road capability, your terrain response, um, and your up and down, and your traction control. And on the left here, by my right by my right knee, you've got your, your, your transmission, your drive, your neutral, your reverse, your park. Got electric handbrake. Remember you've got your release for the boot and your release for the front boot. You've got a back boot and a fruit, a front boot here. But I have to say, what this car is, I can tell even just by driving it quite slow speeds, is this is a driver's EV. And this is what interests me, because there's a lot of EVs out there which are perfect really for commuting and your sort of day-to-day -day grind, but they might be lacking in a bit of engagement and a bit of real sort of chassis control playfulness. What the I-Pace has got, it's got luxury and it's also got playfulness. I'm excited by this because you know what? I'm in a fully electric car made by a mainstream manufacturer who've been in business for 80 odd years. And this is what I like. This is the bit that the Tesla is missing. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about the technology. I'm talking about the finish, the quality, the fit and the finish. I've not seen this level of fit and finish in a full EV. And this is where people like Jag and Porsche will and Mercedes-Benz will um, and Audi, they will be bringing this, the stuff they've been building for decades, to the fight with Tesla. There's actually not enough time for me to explain how you can configure all of this because there's so much tech going on and there's so much integration with your smartphone and dedicated apps. But basically you can have this instrument cluster in front of you as a full width sat nav and then you can throw some of that information down onto this screen here and then down here, this one, like I said before, this is more about your sort of immediate day-to-day -day stuff like your comfort, your heating, your AC, and then you've got the transmission down here on this little wing, drive, neutral, reverse, park. But now I'm gonna actually spend some time in the back. Right, I'm now in the back. I have a glamorous assistant with me, um, and you're s the same height as me, aren't you? I am, yeah. yeah. And this, this seat is, uh, is one of the optional performance seats, so it's, it's shaped a bit more like a bucket seat, but the standard seat's also available. Um, so I'm sat behind the equivalent of myself, in the car, I've got, I've got a ton of leg room. It's got uh, 890 mil rear leg space, which is a lot. I've got loads of headroom. This has got the panoramic glass roof, which I always think is a worthwhile option because it sort of opens up your world. Um, and then if the back seats were down, boot space wise, you've got nearly 1500 litres. Right. I like the way it's packaged and I think that's a big deal when it comes to it. SUVs, because a lot of SUVs are big cars on the outside and not that impressive on the inside. Here's your 656 litres of boot space, and I think you've also got a little bit of added space on here, like a little false floor. There you go, look. That's your kind of extra boot if you've completely filled that end. So you can put a soft sports bag in there, gym kit, that kind of stuff. There's the bonnet vent, can you see? There it is. There we go. Do you know what this badge is called? Jaguar don't talk about it much, but do you know what this particular logo is with a... 
It's called a growler. But slightly better is the one at the back. It's my favourite, the one. The one at the back, that one, the lovely kind of sculpted muscular one, that's called the leaper. The leaper. So on the front of the old Jaguars, it was the statue on the bonnet, like the Rolls Royce, but the, the leaping cat. That's the leaper, the front's the growler. Front growler, back leaper. There you go then, the I-Pace, a British designed, Austrian built, two motor, all wheel drive, 298 mile SUV that's pure EV. And luckily, it doesn't look like an SUV, it looks better than that. I just hope this car drives on the road as good as it has done today. And also I hope that Tesla learn as quickly as they have in the past about how to put a car together really well. This is exciting times for EVs, right?